Now, I've been leaning really hard into the wonder of biochemistry for a few months, and it's been really fun exploring the more elegant details of our chemistry. But it's dishonest to only ever explore that. Because when you start examining life on a chemical level, you also get a window into how messy and incomplete and bonkers the evolutionary process that designed us is. Make no mistake, my central philosophy about biochem is still valid. Life just works. But that's all it does. These little machines that work together in aggregate to make you alive, all they do is just hum along, following the exact instructions your DNA lays out. And sometimes the mechanisms of DNA and interpreting that DNA can make some pretty goofy things happen. Now, I'm not going to get into what happens when DNA and gene expression go completely sideways on you today. That's a super complicated topic and I want to make sure I get it right. For now, let's look at an extremely specific moment during DNA replication, the moment where your DNA gets copied before one of your trillions of cells divides. Today I want to talk about the telomeres at the end of every single one of your chromosomes, and how they turn into a tiny time bomb that inevitably ends most of your cells, and in turn, potentially, you. To recap real quick though, every single one of your cells contains DNA, except for red blood cells and a couple of others, all science is a nesting doll of asterisks, don't at me. That DNA is the code that tells your body which proteins to make and, you know, how to be alive. A cell needs DNA to function. But it gets to the central idea that the whole mechanism of being alive and the whole process of evolution is simply the story of DNA finding new and interesting ways to replicate itself so that it can keep going on, hopefully, into perpetuity. To go into the molecular side of it, DNA, or deoxyribonucleic acid, as it's like fully known, is made up of little letters called nucleotides. Each little bit of DNA information is a single phosphate ion, a single ribose sugar, and then a nucleic acid. In our DNA, there are four potential letters of these nucleic acids. You get adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine. We represent those using the letters A, C, G, T. But to go further into the composition of each individual letter, each little nucleotide also has an OH group on the side here. Like right here, like on the right. That OH is critical during the process of adding new chains to this nucleotide sentence. What'll happen here is, is that that OH gets knocked off so that the phosphates can get joined together. But the fact that it only exists on this side is the start of our problem. Because that means that DNA can only be assembled in one direction. Which is fine, until you realize that DNA is a double helix. It's two strands. So, while one side of the DNA sequence can get replicated all zip-zoom real fast, the other side, uh, has problems. It can't get assembled quite as easily, and so we're gonna have to do some goofy chemistry to make up for the gap here. For 99% of your DNA, there's a workaround for this. You have RNA primers that come in and give the DNA replication mechanism something to latch onto. And while this is all complex and weird, it works to make sure that most of the lagging strand of this DNA molecule gets replicated fine, until we get to the very end of your chromosomes. And actually, yeah, I might be going a little too fast here. Let's zoom out and define what that is. So for context, your DNA is organized into chromosomes at a macro level. For the most part, you've got 22 identical pairs of these, plus your sex chromosomes, for a total of 46. But that number can get a little hazy around the edges. To make sure that the DNA that codes for your genes is protected, the end of each chromosome is just a single code repeated over and over. TTA, GGG. TTA, GGG. Thymine, thymine, adenine, guanine, 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 whatever. This sequence repeats thousands of times to form a barrier between the genetic DNA, that is the DNA that actually codes for stuff, and the void. But why do we even need this barrier, though? What's the problem with replicating DNA at the end of each chromosome? Remember, this side of the DNA strand, the lagging strand, relies on a sequence of RNA primers to work, to get copied. But they aren't perfect, they can only go so far before a little DNA is left off the strand. It's more of a math problem than anything else. These RNA primers and fragments either need incredible luck to latch onto the exact right number of nucleotides, or they just have to leave a few off. You can't just have a fragment attach and overhang. Either the entire fragment comes in here and attaches, or none of it does. Therefore, there is almost always an overhang to deal with of the original DNA strand. 
In our cells, that means there's always a little bit of DNA left over the very end off of this lagging strand, usually about 70 to 100 letters of these nucleotides. That's only half the problem, and it's not as important as the much bigger one. Because while DNA is kinda goofy in how it can't divide at the very end of your linear chromosomes, the other thing that's really important to keep in mind is that your DNA is extremely good at recognizing moments when your DNA is broken. There are so many structures that have evolved to check for breaks in your DNA. If your DNA breaks, you don't function. And therefore, any time your body detects a break in your DNA, there is a whole constellation of enzymes there to repair those breaks and make sure they don't happen in the future. Which is awkward because the very end of a linear chromosome kinda looks like a break in DNA. And so there is a whole class of proteins and enzymes in your body that hide the end of your telomeres from the DNA police, essentially, by completely cutting off a few hundred nucleotides from the end of your telomeres at every division. They use this slack to create a loop at the very end of your DNA, which gets shoved into these protective proteins, which in aggregate are called shelterin. And so no matter what, even if you could perfectly solve the end replication problem, the other side of this basically guarantees that no matter what, your telomeres are going to get shorter every single time your cells divide. Once this part of the chromosome, the one that actually codes for something, is exposed, your cells enter a state called senescence, i.e. this cell stops dividing. Forever. Cells can continue on doing cell business in this state for quite a while. But for the most part, a cell in senescence is essentially holding up a little flag to your immune system saying, Hello, yes, it is time for me to die. And eventually, an immune cell comes along and destroys the senescent cell. And that's the end. Senescence helps with all sorts of things, like healing and inflammation. It's just that, over time, you have more and more cells in senescence. The percentage, as you get older, goes up. Now to be as transparent with you as I possibly can, Aging is a super complex topic that scientists are still trying to figure out. But one theory on how and why aging happens is that a buildup of these senescent cells is a strong contributor to the aging process and the vast array of diseases that eventually, inevitably, lead to death. Telomeres aren't the single reason we get old and die, they're just one of the first dominoes that starts a whole cascading process. And the caveat here is that senescence is only correlated with aging. There's lots of research that shows that the more senescent cells you have, the older you are. And then in other studies outside of human trials, replacing senescent cells helps mitigate certain aspects of age-related disease. However, there has been no study that has demonstrated a mechanism that causes aging based on senescence. So keep that in mind. This entire video could just be describing one huge, goofy coincidence. But this is all life is really intended for. Our cells are only trying to get us to a point where we're old enough to reproduce. The human species did pretty well back in pre-civilization days where life expectancy was somewhere around 25. It's genuinely amazing that medicine and civilization have helped extend life expectancy well into the 70s for most nations. And when you look at this and see what ultimately seems like a very simple problem to solve, it's incredibly human to immediately try to think of solutions. It seems so simple, right? Just find a way to extend telomeres. Which is cool, because that very method exists. In some cells, in your body right now, you have this enzyme called telomerase, which does exactly that. It stamps on the end here and makes sure the telomeres never shorten. Awesome! And therefore, the solution seems hella simple. Just take the telomerase out of those cells and have it in every other cell. Boom! No more senescence. We get immortality. Or at the very least, a way to mitigate the aging process. The whole thing, that's a breeze. We're done here. Until you realize that, actually, a lot of people, right now, do have these immortal cells in them. Cells throughout their body, which are, have activated telomerase and are just having a grand old time with it, being immortal. Uh, we do actually have a label for those kinds of cells. They're called cancer cells. Senescence is actually a really important process due to how accidents happen all the time during DNA replication. Sometimes your DNA mechanisms miss a letter or add an extra one. These little accidents are called mutations, and they're the basis for evolution and the incredible complexity of life we have right now. But at the same time, they're also the basis for a lot of diseases and cancers and all sorts of suffering. So, to ensure your cells don't inevitably mutate and go haywire, your telomeres get shorter and shorter until your cell reaches a pre-programmed limit of divisions, called the Hayflick limit. Ultimately, this end replication problem is a representation of why my core philosophy can sometimes be a bad thing. Life just works. 
It doesn't really plan, it doesn't really think and adapt super quickly, it just works. And the gears wind down, and little pieces of that work can break and go awry. But even when the machine starts to break, life just keeps working even when it has busted instructions. I always end these videos waxing poetic on how beautiful and wondrous life is, how connected you can feel to the richness of being alive by examining it on the chemical level. This is the other side of that coin. Learning about these logistics that doom you can instill a kind of quiet in you. There's an ache here that is hard to describe, a small worry right in the back of your mind that will never go away and, as you get older, will only get louder. And you can leave it at that, or you can turn that feeling on its head too. It's because it's not that you're designed to die, so to speak. Evolution only really prepared us to reproduce. Consciousness is a bizarre and unintended side effect of that evolution. So for me, knowledge of the goofy and broken parts of my design are where I find forgiveness in myself and in others. Because the more I learn about my chemical makeup, the more that I discover that I am an incomplete product. I am the middle of an unfinished process, one that will not finish for, hopefully, another few eons. It is okay to be an unfinished product, and life is even more beautiful when you consider its fragility. How we as a species have been able to do so much with this messy, disastrous set of tools we were given by our biology and by our universe. It's painful sometimes to think about life as it precisely is, but in a way it's even more exciting to consider all the ways consciousness will eventually perfect this messy process of evolution. And I hope this video hasn't been too much of a downer, and I'm sorry if it has been, but what I really hoped for here was instead a quieter look into the other side of the complexities of being alive. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. As always, thank you so much for watching. I'm putting out these videos monthly right now. I'm working really hard to get to that bi-weekly moment. This video is actually secretly a week late because I'm getting really close to that bi-weekly moment and I'm just trying to get my backlog going. We're going to get to much more focused, much more happier topics in the next couple of weeks, uh, talking more about photosynthesis, talking more about mitochondria, and all, and all sorts of really great stuff. As always, please subscribe, like, and most importantly, share this video. The most important thing right now is getting as many eyeballs on this as possible. If you liked this and you want to see more of it, I highly encourage you to go check out my Patreon, where you can ensure that this kind of content keeps getting produced no matter what the economy does. At the same time, as I get corrections and more information on this topic, I'm going to be adding it to a blog post over at my website, clockwork.show, so be sure to check that out. And as always, I am going to be listing my sources in detail and taking criticism from the scientific community over at my Twitter, which is at this underscore clockwork. Be sure to check that out as well. Either way, I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for watching this to the very end. And as always, I'd like to leave you with peace, love, and polymerase. Everyone be well. Thank you so much.